The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Bridging the Employment Gap, offered by the Oregon State University Alumni Association in partnership with Oregon State's Professional and Continuing Education Unit. I'm Greg Aronoff, the Marketing and Communications Manager here with Professional and Canadian Ed, and I'm joined by Yulia Dennis from the Alumni Association, and we also have Cheryl Spain and Sydney Quinton Cox. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to share our agenda for the day. I work for Professional and Canadian Ed, which is the non-credit arm of the university. We partner with colleges across campus to offer open enrollment classes to the public on subjects ranging from workforce training to wood science. We're always excited to continue our partnership with Yulia Dennis from the Alumni Association. I'm sure some of you have joined us for some of our other webinars on the Career Series, so we're excited to have Yulia, Cheryl, and Sydney here to talk about bridging the employment gap. So without further ado, I am going to hand it off. Thank you, Greg. It's always great to partner with you on these webinars. My name is Yulia Dennis, and I oversee our career alumni programs. And I see um, the many of you who have uh, joined us today. I know some of you have already either spoken with me or have joined our programs previously. So welcome back um, to those who have been part of our programs. We know this is a rough time for people, and our programs are here to, to support your career journey, especially during this time. I'm really excited to have Sydney and Cheryl um, speak on this topic. I think right now this is the number one topic that I talk to most people about is, is this the right time to job search? How do I overcome a gap? How do I position myself at this time? I think Cheryl and Sydney are perfect for this webinar. They have a lot of knowledge, many years, and much experience to share with you. So um, if you need help, reach out to me, um, contact me on LinkedIn. And um, like I said, we're, we're here to help. And just a few housekeeping reminders for everyone. Uh, please feel free to ask questions during the webinar via the chat box. We're gonna be pausing between every single slide to, to get your questions answered. Questions will, will be addressed throughout and then a link will be emailed to you at the end of the uh, presentation. And with that, um, Greg, go ahead and move to Sydney's slide, and I'm going to turn it over to Sydney to so she can introduce herself. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Quinton Cox, and I'm a 2017 bioengineering graduate. After college, I moved down to the Bay Area to work in the pharma industry. Then I transitioned to 3D printed medical device manufacturing. But actually, in between those two different jobs and industries, I had an eight month gap. So I'm really excited to share with you what I learned during that time period. Wonderful. Thank you, Sydney. And then I'm also going to introduce, I have Cheryl introduce herself. And um, Sydney is part of our OSU College of Business, and I'm excited to have her here as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl Spann. I'm an instructor in marketing at OSU. I've been involved with marketing, I hate to even kind of say it, about 40 years now. I've reinvented my work and my positions within marketing in four different types of careers over that time period. And during that time period, was involved with quite a few uh, periods of recession, uh, layoffs, that sort of thing. So what we're facing now in some ways is not uh, unique to me, other than the fact, of course, uh, we have a virus this time. But in the case of job search, um, a lot of the things that we're going to share today apply in regards to that. So looking forward to talking with you and sharing some experiences that I've had as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl. And I also want to add that it's been great to, to talk with Cheryl. I personally have also learned from her experience and uh, and I find that she has a lot of insights. And then also with Sydney, I want to mention that she's one of our alumni career ambassadors. She's one of our best ambassadors. We're doing some uh, career connection events with her as well. So I'm just so grateful to both of them for their involvement. Um, with regards to today's webinar, a very quick overview. We're going to be re learning how to reframe a gap in employment and what are insights that you can update your resume and uh, how do you boost your job research and understanding what can you do right now at this time to boost your your job search. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sydney. Thank you, Yulia. 
Okay, so when you are looking for a new job, one of the most important things to do is to frame your experience. Uh, this is something that you do where you are telling your story. You've looked at your past, where you've been, you've determined what your values are, and you think about your future and where you're headed. So you can tell this story in a hundred different ways. But what is incredibly important about reframing is to find the story that connects your past to your future with your values while doing it in a confident way. Confidence is key to making sure that you present yourself in a way in your interviews that will get you that job. It's about making sure that you frame this gap as in a way your choice. You are choosing to either stay in your industry or you are deciding that you are going to switch to a different industry for X, Y, and Z reasons. So when you're showing up to that interview, you are excited, you know who you are, you know your values, and you know why you fit in that company and why you're the perfect fit for that role and position and why you should be there. So framing your experience, it definitely takes some time and some thought to work through that. But these, especially these long unemployment gaps, they really allow you to dig deep into where you are going ne next. And then with that, Yulia, we can go on to the next piece as well. Wonderful. And Greg, um, now is the time for our first poll question. So Greg's going to read that off and then he'll share the results with us. Okay. And the question is, um, let's launch, launch it here. What's your educational alumni status? So if you could select one of the following, student, just graduated, recent grad, alumni, or a little bit older. So as the results come in, it looks like um, it's all across the board. It's right now, the majority is alumni graduated five to 15 years. And, and that's... Go ahead, Julia, I'm sorry. Oh, so a comment on that is I am not surprised because the people people I'm talking to, this is impacting pretty much everyone across the board, regardless of, of how long ago they graduated, if they're new grads or whatnot. Um, and then do we have some uh, chat questions, Greg? Uh, we do. So this would be a good one. Let's see. Looking for general advice when you are at a point where you are overqualified for entry-level jobs but not qualified enough for the next step in terms of uh, like requisite experience I think I'd like to take that one uh, this is Cheryl speaking I definitely throughout the years as I went from job to job um, and found myself in various periods where I was between positions um, and particularly as I went along in my career obviously and had more and more experience would sometimes find that I was in that position where I was either underqualified for a position or I was way overqualified for a position. And so I had to address both of those types of questions and I might as well address that now very quickly. In terms of underqualified, what I found is the key there was to go out and continue to get either additional education or additional training or to take an internship or some sort of a part-time, <clears throat> excuse me, position, <clears throat> excuse me, where um, you could get additional experience and then go back out and uh, reapply for those types of positions. In regards to being overqualified, the key there was really to show again throughout your resume how you have continued to reinvent yourself along the way. And so you're never really overqualified. All of your experiences that you're providing are providing different angles to a certain job that's a huge benefit to them as a company. Because here is where you show that you're unique to a lot of other individuals that are applying for that same job that may have taken the typical career path to get to that position. And yet you have actually um, done additional things to make you a better qualified candidate. And I'll actually talk about that a little bit when I get to one of my other slides. So I hope that that was helpful in answering that question. Wonderful. Thank you, Sharon. And, and Sydney, what do you think as far as especially from your experience um, with that question? 
I think it's really all about how you frame it. So it's going to probably take you a bit of time to think through how you want to have that conversation with your future employer. It depends on the job, depends on the industry, but I'd be more than happy to help you with that. And I'm sure Yulia would be as well. Thank you. And um, Sydney, one more question that was submitted uh, in the registration. How, how does one go about best explaining an employment gap? What would you recommend? The way that I like to think about unemployment gaps is really an important self-discovery time. So people who have gotten a job within say less than three months or so, they haven't really had that long period of time to think about how they want to shift and change their career, whether or not they're passionate enough to stay and keep pushing forward. So let's say you're in an industry, you have a six month unemployment gap. Well, if you're still looking for a job in that industry, you can frame it as a way of, you know what, you are so incredibly passionate about staying in this industry. It's where you want to be. You're taking classes on the side. You're doing X, Y, and Z to make sure that you can continue to fit there. And that's why you want to stay. You're a candidate that will stay at that company and in that position long term. But if you decide throughout that process, once you've got into that six months, that you know you want to do something different it's okay to say hey i spent the first four months thinking that i wanted to go live for example on the west coast but i decided that i wanted to instead stay on a different coast or live somewhere else stay close to family or oh this thing happened in my life and that's why i have changed it's okay to shift during your unemployment gap for what you're looking for. And that's oftentimes why there's a longer unemployment gap for people. So other people have been through this as well. Recruiters are human, they understand. I actually, in my case, used more of what I would call radical transparency. I, I wanted to make sure that they understood my gap in unemployment and what I was searching for next. So I would definitely recommend that. Great, thank you. I think we're ready now for the next section on enjoying the discovery stage. Perfect, okay. So one of the things about an unemployment gap is that it's one of the few times in our life when we don't have to go to work from nine to five, for example. Like you can really spend this time focusing on yourself. And so I know that a lot of times people feel like they need to be applying from jobs early in the morning to late at night, but I think it's so critical to take a moment to pause, to enjoy this time and really rejuvenate yourself. So if you're someone who loves to go for a run in the morning, please do. Maybe you like to go hiking or painting or play with your dog. Take the time to hit pause and enjoy your time during this unemployment, when you can reframe your personal experience instead of being frustrated and annoyed and really down about this long unemployment gap, if you can shift that frame of thought to, you know what, I'm really enjoying this. I'm living my best life. I'm doing more of the things that I enjoy that I never had the chance to do when I had a job. You're going to be able to show up to those interviews in a way where you just have this uh, energy around you that shows that you are an excited, happy person, you know what you're looking for, and you're really going to become a much more attractive candidate to interviewers and to your future teammates. So finding joy, really figure out what that means for you. And then I highly recommend journaling. This is a very reflective process, especially in those long unemployment gaps. So look at your past experience. What do you want to continue? What do you want to change? look at your values and make sure that what you do next really aligns with those values. Maybe you have determined that you want to make sure that you can be there for your kid's soccer game. And that means that some of those jobs you're going to go to might be different. And so it's really up to you to determine what you're willing to compromise on and what you're not. 
every person is different. So everyone's values and what they need in a job will be different as well. So just make sure that you align that job searching with your values and those future goals, say something that's five, 10 years out, what do you want your lifestyle to look like? What do you want the company to be like and the position? Those are all really great things to look into during this time of unemployment. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, Greg, we have another poll question and then Greg's going to read off the, the responses. Okay. And the question is, are you currently in a gap in employment? So yes or no. And as the results come in, it looks like the majority is yes, with nearly 80% uh, saying yes. And, and that's very consistent with the people I work with. I, I would say right now I'm at about 70, 30% of the people I work with. And then Greg, do we have a chat a question that's good for this slide? Uh, we do. So someone asked, as someone who's taken multiple contract positions in order to gain a broader knowledge base, how do I now explain that to employers that I'm not just a job hopper and that I truly want to build a long-term career with one organization? That's a really good question. And I'm going to have Sydney answer first, and then I want Cheryl to answer that one as well. So we'll have Sydney and then Cheryl. That's a great question. Thank you, Yulia. So I would actually start by framing this as you took X, Y, and Z position to gain this skill, and then you took the next position to gain another skill. And so you can actually frame those contract positions as a way that you are able to get a broad array of skills, and that actually makes you more qualified for this position, and it makes you such a good fit, and that you actually are ready and you are excited to take what you've learned and put it into a full-time position. It is wonderful to say that you, you're doing a great job. You, you really did well with that. So it's going to be how you frame it. Thank you. Cheryl, what are, what do you think about that one? This is also, I agree, totally a very important question and possibly one that a lot of people are going to have to address this time because I think they're going to be, Quite a few people um, with this particular situation going on that may be facing a couple of years of being between jobs. I did have this happen to me at one point. Um, actually, it happened at, at the same time that my father had a stroke, so I really needed to also be available for him for family reasons. And I started taking contract positions because I knew it was important for me to stay nearby and for me to be flexible to be available. And so what I ended up doing actually, uh, first of all, is I turned it into a consulting firm, my own consulting firm. And that's one way that I handled it inside on side my resume to be able to show that I had an extended period of time doing a certain thing that in effect was in the area of marketing and marketing research and new product consulting. And it worked incredibly well as I went out later then to find another position because I could explain the gap. I could explain that I was also continuing to work and improve in my field um, in line with what Sydney was saying in terms of getting maybe additional skills or just working in a particular area of my field. And it also gave me an opportunity to assess maybe different directions I might want to go with my field going forward once I ended up deciding, okay, it was great to work by myself. It was great to be a consultant, but now I really do miss being part of a team and I'm now gonna go into this direction. So it was even part of my reflective period in terms of being able to assess the new direction I wanted to go into. So, and it also kept me energized because I was constantly working with different people, learning different things. And I didn't feel as though I was really unemployed because essentially I wasn't. Yes, it was hard work, to go out there and get those projects and to handle all of the work and to deal with all the things that were going on in my personal life at the same time. But it was really a very, very informative and productive period of my life. And I still use those examples in some cases in the classroom as I'm teaching students about different ways to, in this case, get involved with marketing and to go out and job hunt and put yourself in a great position to be productive and go on to that next position. That's wonderful. I love both of the advice that uh, both Sydney and Cheryl shared, and I think that that's such a relevant thing. Uh, one more question. Um, this one is for Sydney. 
Uh, the question is, how do I keep positive at this time? It's hard to stay positive when I see that there's a lot of job loss. And what do you recommend for that? That's a wonderful question. And I totally know how that is. Uh, based on the last question as well, I can also say that I'm recently unemployed due to COVID-19 layoff. So I'm right there with you in this situation. And one of the things that I would say is that looking back on what I did during that eight month unemployment gap, I came up with what I call a back to being list. And it's this list of things that bring me joy, whether it's a cup of coffee or going to the beach, something that makes me smile and makes me kind of step away and get out of that mindset of negativity. So every person's going to be different with that. I implore you to find your own. Maybe you enjoy painting. Maybe you want to play with your dog. Those are some of the things that I enjoy doing. And so if you can add that into your day and in a way, almost schedule that time to take care of yourself into your day. Let's say you're looking for jobs and you plan to spend your day nine to five as if you already had a job. You're updating your resume, you're networking, you're applying to jobs. Well, add in there a few times that day to go for a walk outside and try to do things that really truly bring you joy and also find connection with others. That is really great advice. Speaking of connections with others, I think we're ready for the next section, which hits on just that point. Perfect. Yeah. So connecting with others, especially during COVID-19, is incredibly important. We have so many people that have now been told that they have to shelter in place. So those in-person uh, in coffee meetups or lunches, it's not really happening anymore. So instead, I recommend that you ask people to video chat. Maybe these are people that you used to work with, maybe they're friends or family, or a connection that you've always wanted to talk to a little bit more. So what's great about video is that it's able to increase that connection. And then when you're in those chats, make sure that you also take the time to learn about their career needs so that you can help them where they're at. This is really something that can be two-sided. You can help others even when you're unemployed. You still have a network that you can draw upon and connect people with. So use that. Use that as a way to help others during this time as well. And then share your reframed story. If the first time you share this reframing of your situation is at this interview for a job you love and are so excited for, it's not going to sound as genuine and as smooth and clean as it would if you talk to it about it with 10 other people who haven't heard the way that you speak about it before. So definitely practice that. Um, and then I always recommend that you ask who are three other people I should chat with next? When you're networking, it's not necessarily about your first connection that will be able to get you a job and those all important referrals. It's actually really about the second or third person down the way that you get connected to that are going to be able to help you with that and expand your network as well. So ask for an introduction to those three people. Um, it's a wonderful way to go about expanding your network and having more people who can discuss your reframing story with you as well. And make sure that you follow up with them with a thank you. Um, when you're trying to set up these video calls, one other piece that I want to mention is that it's really important to send reminders. Everyone is overwhelmed with COVID. Everyone has something happening in their life right now. And oftentimes that email or that text could be forgotten. Maybe they saw it and didn't have time to respond um, or it just ended up at the bottom of their inbox. It's totally okay to send a reminder. In fact, please do, even if it's three or four, Everyone needs a chance to be reminded because we just have so much going on in our heads right now and in our lives. Very good advice. And also most jobs aren't even posted or they're offered to people that people know. So I think this connecting with others is so important. And Greg, we're ready for our next poll question. Okay.
So the next question is, how long have you been unemployed? Um, it's like one of the following recent grad, less than three months, three to six months or so, one year or over a year. And as the results come in, it looks like the majority are in that uh, three, to, three to six months or so, um, followed by less than three months. Great, thank you for that. And um, Greg, do we have a, a chat question that's good for this slide? Yes, um, so it's actually one question I was thinking about. How do you explain a gap when um, it's not an interview, so it's just at the resume level? So um, are there, is that a potential red flag? Like, would you call it out in a cover letter? Is there any way to get ahead of it when you submit your resume or um, what do you guys think? That's a really good question. I want to do the same thing, have Sydney share and then have Cheryl share their responses for that. Sometimes it can be called in a, called out in a resume. Other times you can reformat your resume to highlight the most important skills that you and jobs that you've had in the past for the career you want to have in the future. But if you have a long-term unemployment gap, I actually highly recommend reaching out to recruiters first and being like, hey, like, are you willing to chat with me for 10 or 15 minutes? I'd love to learn about what you are in need of at your company and to see if I could potentially fit in well in the future. So one thing to know about recruiters is they love to have someone in their back pocket for a position. At the end of the day, they want to fill those fast with someone who is going to be a great fit because it makes them look good as well. So if you can be there and be that person for a recruiter and you've already built that rapport and connection where you've explained through your framing what that employment gap is from, then that's a great way to do it. Great, thank you. And Cheryl, how about you? I think the first thing you need to ask yourself is what is the real reason for that gap? Um, if, first of all, you're going to be in the middle of training or you're involved with something over a period of time that's actually adding to your skill set, that's a positive. If you're dealing with a family issue, like I was, as I mentioned earlier, that's considered a positive because people understand these sort of things. However, if there's a period of time in which you don't have something like that, then yes, you've got to address it on your resume. And that's when I think it's really critical that you're doing some sort of work. Even if I at one point had a long period of time in which I was actually back in school, but I also decided I would work at night in a call center to do sales and marketing. And I learned what it was like to do that type of sales and marketing. And I use that, even though that was something that really wasn't at the level of what I was now doing professionally, I used it as a skill that I could then put into my resume to, again, talk about what I was doing with that period of time. I would not put it in the cover letter because the key is that the whole purpose of the cover letter is to entice someone to want to read that resume and consider you for an interview. And if you put something in the cover letter that could in any way, shape or form appear to be something you're trying to explain that you see as a potential negative, or that they might see as a potential negative, that could potentially put you in the round file, as they say. So I would deal with it within your resume and be prepared to answer any questions in regards to it during the interview. Very, very good points. Um, and I think now we're ready for the next section, um, which is gonna be Cheryl talking about um, continuing the search. Okay, so first of all, I think you all recognize that job hunting is a job itself. Um, we're seeing that most of you have been out for three to six months. That sounds about right. You've got a bunch of people who are a little bit less than three. That probably had to do with the COVID situation more than anything else. I think the most important aspect of this type of a job, and it really is a job, is that you have to be prepared to work and to work hard on a constant basis. Now, at the same time, I agree with Sydney that you need to set up a certain time uh, during the day or a certain number of days each week that you're actually doing certain things. And then you need to make sure that you have time for recharging. So as an example, I would look at my week and I would say, fine, on Mondays, I'm going to be looking to see what sort of leads I have, whether it's for networking purposes or whether it's for certain types of job opportunities that have now shown up over the weekend. And I'm now going to start applying maybe on Tuesday and Wednesday. 
And then when I, by the time I got to Thursday, that's when I typically tried to network with someone. Usually, of course, it was for coffee or for lunch or something along those lines, or I was going to an association, a professional association that I was a member of. Again, great networking opportunities. Now, as we know, you have to set up Zoom meetings. But you're getting to a point where when you start getting towards Friday, you're either coming back and you're uh, following up with you know, either interview requests that you've gotten or people that have reached out to you or you've reached out to them by uh, LinkedIn or whatever it happens to be. And by the time you get to the weekend, I made my weekend sacred. I really did. I said, I've got to recharge. I also did try to walk or go for a swim or again, things you might want to do because you enjoy doing, whether it's, you know, going out for walks with your dog or whatever. I did that as well, by the way, that you need to make sure that you're recharging. So you're positive. The real key here is don't believe that 2020 is going to be an impossible year to obtain a job because it's not for those who are going to are willing to work hard. Those who are willing to maybe consider modifying the direction of their career going in maybe a little bit different direction. Those who are willing to relocate that unfortunately is critical. I had to do that a lot. That's what puts you in a position where you're as flexible as possible to be available to what a company is looking for. Because ultimately what they're looking for is more important than what you're looking for, at least as far as they're concerned. So the key here is that you have to do the research to figure out what's going on in your field. Get a sense of whether the kind of job you're currently doing or what you did earlier, if that's still a growth field or a growth position within your field, or whether you need to modify and move over into a different aspect of your field, or whether your field is closing down. It's so changing that you're now going to have to look at maybe retraining and doing something different. I've had to do that a few times because you would think marketing, wow, that's pretty broad. It's pretty wide open. You should always be able to get a job there. Yes, that's true. Sales and marketing tend to be that way. But the industries are changing. And depending on the kind of job you're doing in the kind of industry or the kind of company or where you are even in the country in terms of that kind of work, it can come and go. So you have to become a detective. You have to essentially really try to get a sense of what's going on and, and analyze that. It's a numbers game. It's getting out as many resumes as you can, but very targeted focused. And if what you're finding is not working, then you've got to shift your direction because the key is you don't want to be out of work if you can help it for more than a year. Um, now, admittedly with COVID, I think people are going to be more understanding that there is more of a longer time of unemployment that some people might be facing. So maybe you can get away with a couple of years if that's what it ends up being. And I hope it is, isn't that way for most of you, obviously. But the key is that companies are looking. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is kind of the seasonality of how companies look, all right? So first, they work on their quarter system and in terms of their profits, okay? And what they're doing for their shareholders and everything. So essentially, and they also look at what's going on in terms of whether people are on vacation or not. The summer is the hardest time to get people to, to actually interview. Right now, we're in the height of when people are typically not interviewing others, okay? Everybody's on vacation. Think about it. The people who are going to interview you are probably on vacation. Well, hopefully they are. We're, we're all doing something different this year, let's face it. But that being said, in about four weeks, it's going to start building again because companies now are starting to put out those jobs and they're starting to look at those resumes and they're gonna start interviewing people again. And that will happen again until about Thanksgiving. And then between Thanksgiving and around the second week of January, not much is going on again. Everybody tends to be on vacation, you know, experiencing the holidays. Then you've got January happens. Sometimes companies get rid of people that they're not that interested in keeping. Now they have positions open again and starting in February, they start interviewing again. Okay, so there is a seasonality aspect to it. So what do you do during those times when there's not a lot going on? This is when you're doing your research, you're recharging, maybe you're going back and getting some additional training, whatever, maybe you're just networking, but that's the key, is that remember that there are a lot of people who've already been in your shoes and they're eager to help you out. And don't give up, don't get discouraged about this because the key, again, as Sydney was saying, is be positive, be energized, and you're gonna get that job. There's no question about it. Thank you for that. Um, and we have another poll question that Greg's gonna give. Okay, and the question is, <clears throat> were you laid off due to COVID? So select one of the following, yes or no? 
So we'll watch the uh, the results come in. Right now, it's the majority is no, about um, 33 to 67. And I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Great, thank you. And uh, one of the questions that was submitted that I think is perfect for this section is, if you lose your job or anticipating losing your job, is this a good time to consider a career change or is it better to stay in your lane and write it out? What do you think, Cheryl? Well, I think there's several aspects to this. First of all, how happy are you in this position? Um, in terms of the type of career that you're in, you know, that kind of work, are you happy with that kind of work first? Second, how happy are you with the organization itself? Um, so really do some personal assessment, okay, to start with. Second, um, I would not just panic and think that you're about to get on the layoff list, okay? Um, I think that they can smell that, so to speak. They're aware if you start getting nervous, they're aware too, to some extent, if you even start looking. However, I don't think there's ever a time that you shouldn't at least be tapped into your field and connected with your network to get a sense of where there might be opportunities. I mean, that's some of where I think LinkedIn is really helpful because you can do that without a company or organization being aware of what's going on, okay? And uh, the key to finally is continue to do the absolute best you can in your job. In fact, if anything, go overboard to make sure you're not on that layoff list in case by chance that does happen because they are going to be monitoring that. And to some extent, they may be down to where they're saying, okay, unfortunately, we have to call 10 people out of this group of 30. Um, we've got eight that we know we want to call, but there's another two we're not sure about. And they're starting to consider, you know, various individuals and you might be on that list. And then all of a sudden they see that you're really working hard. You're adding to the team. Guess what? You're going to come off that layoff list. So put yourself in a really good position there. Thank you. That's great. And actually that leads well into the next section, which is on LinkedIn. Um, we do have previous webinars on LinkedIn. So this one's going to be just a really quick overview uh, by Cheryl. Uh, but I encourage you to watch your other webinars on LinkedIn uh, if you want to know more about using that platform. Okay, so first, like I said, the key again is your networking and LinkedIn is a great place to do it. Make sure that your profile is up to date, that it includes, you know, areas that you feel you have strength in, that it includes uh, maybe examples of some of your work to the extent that you can share that based on whether it's, you know, something you truly can share or not um, based on your company's policy. Um, and also make sure you get some uh, references in there. Um, you know, those tend to be harder and harder to get, it seems, over time. But on the other hand, this is a way for either recruiters, and they're always, you know, trolling LinkedIn to see if there are individuals out there that might meet some of their needs for positions they have open, or for you to be able to connect with others that are in your field. Also looked on LinkedIn in terms of those professional organizations. It's also a great place, as you know, to research industries and to see job opportunities. The key here, though, too, is mainly to connect with people there that you want to actually talk to. And apart from network, net, uh, LinkedIn, another place to network is professional organizations. So, you know, at one point I was a member of the American Marketing Association, as an example. Or you can find sometimes when they're offering um, networking events in your area or they're offering some sort of a a conference. I mean, I've been involved with several conferences over the last two or three weeks. They're now all Zoomed, but you get to network online with people and it's a great way to connect with other people in your field. The key ultimately is to remember that you are a brand and you've got to think of yourself as such because companies, when they're looking at all these resumes for one position, they're trying to find quickly resumes that are going to stand out. So the important thing is for you to be unique. And that's where some of these other jobs that you go off and do that put you in a position to show that you're unique are key. I'll give you a very quick example. When I was interested in going back into publishing, I recognized what would be really cool is if I had experience working at a uh, printer that you know got involved with publishing a book, worked at a distributor, a book distributor, where I was involved with sales of a book, I was involved then inside of a publishing house in terms of being a marketing director. So I worked with editors to determine, okay, here's the copies that are coming in. Um, do we take this book and publish it or not? And I worked with authors out there, some being academic, some not academic, to work in terms of marketing and public relations. So I had been involved with every single aspect of publishing that made me very unique when I wanted to go back into publishing and get a job there 
and it caused me to come to the top of the pile when they were looking at possible uh, individuals to uh, interview. That's a really great story. And we have um, another poll question that Greg's gonna pull up for us. Okay, and the question is, are you considering moving into a new industry or profession? So yes or no. And I'll keep it up for a little bit longer. It looks like the majority, the clear majority is yes at nearly 75%. Great. Wow. Yeah. And, and I'm not surprised because we're having huge shifts in industries at this time. Greg, do we have um, some chat questions that we can um, give to, to Cheryl right now? We do. We have one. It's how do you frame periods of unemployment that were due to burnout and depression? It took me a long time to recover and I ended up spending two years out of work. Well, that's a great question because I have to tell you right from the start that most of us, when we are laid off, um, we are burned out. And in some ways, yes, we are depressed because you know what? We are reacting to the fact that a company that we were part of, and in some cases may have been part of for quite a few years, um, where, you know, that company was kind of our family in some ways. You know, we had a lot of friends there, you know, to some extent our self-worth or our identity is, is located there. Um, you know, we're feeling pretty down and I understand how that feels when you go into that situation and it's not at all uncommon. In fact, it's probably uncommon in some ways if you don't feel that way, unless you just happen to be in a really bad work situation and you were like, well, thank goodness I'm out of there, you know, type of reaction. But going backwards, if you're talking about having uh, been out of a position or out of your field for a couple of years and the real reason was, frankly, you just needed time to recharge the key here was that you also needed time to redirect because you recognized you were smart enough and um, in a strong enough position to recognize when you were not necessarily where you needed to be. And sometimes that happens for people. They may even get a degree in a certain field and find out when they actually go into their profession in that field that it really isn't what they should be doing. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That happens to people all the time. And so that's lots of times when people will find that they have to redirect. And you can put together, in effect, again, a story about that and turn it into a positive. So that's the real key here. You need to be able to do that. And um, as long as it's a story that you believe, you will very quickly enable others to believe that. And those that don't and don't recognize the importance of that, that's probably not where you need to be anyway. You need to find the right employer for your next step that's gonna put you in a position that's going to recharge you and, and make you feel more positive about where you're now going with your career. That's, I also I'm in, oh, go ahead. Uh, that's so funny. So I was, Sydney, I was about to say, I think this is a great question for you as well. I also wanna chime in and ask you some questions about what were you doing during those two years? Were you working on any personal projects? Were you inspired by anything? Were you helping with family care? Were you traveling? Like, it's okay to have these gaps. It's okay to recover from burnout. And you did something during that time, most likely. So figure out how to add that into your story in a way that is compelling. I think that's perfect advice. Excellent. And then um, now we're ready to go on to the next section, which is on resume writing. And I think this is also something that's really important. And I know a lot of people struggle with this one. So I'm really excited to have Cheryl share about this. Okay, first of all, I want to tag on a little bit to the last question again, because it does tie in with resume writing. Because obviously, you're now going to have to take um, a gap, whether it's a three month gap or two year gap and put that into your resume. So I agree with Sydney that again, the key is to say, okay, what did I do during that time period? And how do I spin that in a positive way to indicate the skills I might have learned or the reason that I'm now changing the direction of my career or I'm changing the kind of work I now want to do. Okay, and once you do that, then again, it puts you in a great position where it explains that gap, all right? The other thing that a few other points I want to make that are here on the slide actually too is, you know, 
it's really important to, if you've got a fairly short gap that you can essentially, and I hate to say the word, but in a way hide that gap or minimize that gap by writing, rewriting your resume using the months of your position. Because if it ties in pretty quickly or pretty closely, it's not gonna show up that much. The other thing that I do is I put a skills section up at the top. And I also try to, again, go back to what we said earlier about look for those consulting contracts so that you can list them under your own consulting firm. And you may find out eventually that that's actually what you wanna do going forward. Uh, for some people, that's exactly what they ended up doing. I know during previous times of long unemployment, a lot of people found themselves out there for a period of time and ended up transitioning from working inside the workforce into working as a consultant um, in their field. Now, admittedly, you typically have to have at least five, if not 10 years worth of experience to be able to do that. And I noticed again with what we found out earlier that a lot of you are at the five to 15 year mark, which is by the way, typically the time you reassess your career and figure out, is this where I wanna go or do I wanna try something different? So again, this is really not a gap. Look at it as an opportunity to reposition yourself and move forward. And last but not least on this, the key are these interim positions. I don't mean internships, I mean interim, because you're looking for opportunities that can either build your skill set or that can build your contacts or can give you an opportunity to maybe try a different industry or try a different approach within your industry and see if there's a position within that. Really good, solid advice. And Greg, we have our last poll question that we're gonna do. Okay. So this is, are you actively looking for employment? So if you can pick your top two, and it's very actively, active daily, multiple times a week, monthly, or pause search or uh, recharging. So as the results come in, um, it looks like the majority are in the uh, the last one, the uh, the pausing, searching. Um, now that's tied with uh, multiple times a week. So those are the clear uh, top two where the majority of folks are. And and that makes total sense um, with what I see as well that people are either very active or they're they're pausing it. And Greg, do we have some um, chat questions that we can give to both um, Sydney and Cheryl? Uh, we do. So I like this question. The gist of it is, if you're unemployed, what are your thoughts about going back to an industry that you have experience, but you are not very passionate about compared to uh, trying to forge ahead into a new industry or new position that you are passionate about, but you have less experience and there's potentially uh, more competition? So hmm. I'd like to have... Um, I'd like to have Sydney answer that question first and then Cheryl answer. I think that's a great question and it really comes down to what do you want? What do you want your day to look like? Where are you trying to go? What do you want your future to look like, say, five or 10 years out? Because these employment gaps, they're really a moment for you to pause and reassess where you want to go is going to that industry you've been in before, is that taking a step backwards for you when you think about your 10-year goal? If that's the case, I would encourage you to think about what you can do differently in order to step into that new industry that helps you feel like you're going forward instead of backwards. Thank you, and Cheryl, how about you? Well, first of all, I'd wanna know how long you've been out of work. Um, also to what extent you either love or hate the former industry that you were a part of and why you ended up considering transitioning to a new industry to start with. But apart from that, I think the key here is this, you look in both, okay? Because if you've been out of work for quite a period of time and you're getting to a point where either financially or emotionally um, or career-wise, you know, because it also depends on where you are in your career. Are you, you know, five years out from your degree? Are you at year 15 or are you at year 25? You know, where are you, okay? And again, it goes back to what I was saying in terms of being a detective, getting a sense of what's going on in both of those industries or both of those fields, where you are in terms of your career path and your life path, and then from there determining, okay, what am I giving up to go one direction versus another? But then finally, 
if you're actually reaching out in both directions simultaneously, um, you'll also get some feedback as to where the opportunities are at a faster pace for you. Now, if it ends up being that you're gonna go back to a previous type of an industry, a previous type of position, and you're a little bit concerned about it, try to determine what it is that you're concerned about and then try to address that somehow within the time that you're interviewing with this organization so that you can determine, hey, was it just that they, um, that you were working 60 hour work weeks and you had to go into work and you're commuting 30 minutes each way and now they allow remote work and now that's gonna reduce that concern. You know what I mean? See what has changed maybe since the time you've even been in that industry because your needs may have also changed and you may be able to come together. So I know at one point when I was looking, um, I was looking in three different directions because I was again trying to assess where is my greatest opportunity to be able to come into a field and to do it fairly quickly. But admittedly at that point, I'd been out of work for more than six months and I was starting to get a little concerned. So, um, you know, I want to give you several approaches to go at this point and then assess the results that you're seeing as you're doing it and get to know yourself better in terms of where you think ultimately is the best direction to go. Last but not least, you could potentially take a position that's not perfect for you for a period of time to put yourself in a position to be able to pay your bills, et cetera, et cetera, while you're then continuing to network and look at that new opportunity going in a different direction. And maybe you do that a year or two later, who knows? But be flexible. And from that standpoint, you'll be in a really good position to find the right job going forward. That's great. I love that advice. And now we're ready for the summary and we'll have Sydney share her key summary takeaways and then we'll have Cheryl sh share her key takeaways. Well, based on that last poll question where people were saying that they're taking that pause, you know what? I love that. I think that that's so important to take that time to recharge. So set a date on your calendar and write it down as to when you are going to start to get back to work and start doing more of that full-time job searching. But again, making sure that you add those pieces of joy in as well. So maybe you decide that you're gonna do that two weeks from now, maybe it's a month from now, maybe you're gonna go, I don't know if you can necessarily travel right now, but maybe you're going to go do something different or you're going to explore a different avenue. I think that's wonderful. Please take that time to recharge. It's so critical. And one other piece that I'd like to add is you guys have asked some really great questions that I think need us to ask more questions of you as well to really get to the bottom of some of these pieces. So please don't hesitate at all to reach out to Julia, myself, Cheryl. We're all here happy and willing to help you through this process. I love that. Thank you so much. Cheryl, what are your summary takeaways? Well, obviously, I'd like to echo what Sydney said, but also I think the key here is recharge. But while you're recharging, even try to figure out how you want to network, because networking is not as hard as actually looking for job opportunities and filling out those applications. Oh, my goodness. Some of them are so long forever and then not hearing from anybody. That's where the discouragement comes in. So the key is what you're going to find is when you're networking, that's where you're going to get more of the encouragement coming back from people. And you're going to also hear about different directions that you can go. Don't give up. That's the real key here. And I know that's easier said than done. I really do. But this is really a great opportunity for you to reassess where you are in your career path, maybe in some cases in your life path, and determine how you're going to go forward from here. And some of the things you're going to learn during this period of time are going to actually assist you in additional jobs down the, down the track here, as well as in some cases, you may meet someone that is now becoming a best friend. You know, you never know how this is going to have positive things that are come back into your life. So look at this actually as more of an opportunity than a gap. And um, again, we're here for you. Um, don't give up. We're encouraging. Um, you can do it. There's no question about it. You can do it. And we hope that we hear how you do ultimately. That's great. Thank you. And uh, for the next steps, um, very quickly, uh, do join our Beaver Cruise LinkedIn group, and then you can follow us on LinkedIn. And we have time for one more question. So, Greg, do we have a uh, chat question that we can um, give to to Sydney and Cheryl right now? 
Um, no, we have a, uh, I guess I could look through one of the, uh, the, uh, pre-written questions was, um, what's the best way to get noticed? Um, is there just any quick tips for having your resume stand out? Um, Cheryl, how about, um, that one for you? Well, you know, even though I have about 40 years of experience, I have a one page resume. And the reason is because I know with for a lot of people, they have very long resumes and, you know, that's not going to stand out. It's going to cause people to say, I'm not interested in reading this. Remember, you're going to capture them in about the first 15 seconds. So look at your resume, see how it is developed in terms of, first of all, showing your skills um, and then highlighting those key uh, fields that you've been a part of what I have three or four different careers. So what I ended up doing actually is trying to group them in that way to be able to then allow somebody to be able to go into the resume and quickly pull out the section that they're most interested in looking at. But I think the other thing that's important is to ensure that um, you've got the kind of training or education that is going to support that position, um, that you also have your LinkedIn uh, contact there at the top so that they can go to LinkedIn and see other types of details about your positions, or they can read some of the references that, that might be there for, for you as well. Um, the other thing too is when you actually go to uh, apply online, uh, have some examples of your work that you can attach if it's all possible to that application, or have a list of references that you could attach, or reference letters, that's even better, that you can attach to that application. All these different things that make you stand out. And I think the most important thing on your cover letter is, first of all, it's not more than a page. Um, you try to capture them in the first two sentences. And then when you're talking about your experience and how it relates to the job itself, look at the bullet points of what they're listing that they're really looking for and compress that down to four or five key bullet points. And then you literally talk about that in your cover letter of how you've got that exact experience, hopefully, or how you have some sort of experience that it could apply there. So again, they're going through that cover letter and in a matter of the first four or five sentences, you've got them hooked. And now they're gonna glance at your resume and pick up the phone or email you or whatever and reach out to you. That's really good advice. And I do recommend if you have, um, if you're going through a job search right now, even if you're on that pause, send over your resume to me and we'd be glad to review it for you. Send over your cover letter, send over your LinkedIn profile, et cetera. Uh, we have like a career engagement team at the Alumni Association and we have alumni ambassadors such as Sydney who are wonderful as well. And we're all here to, to help you out. Uh, here's my email address again, um, just so that you're aware um, on that next slide. And then I'm actually gonna um, turn over to Greg and uh, Sydney and Cheryl, thank you so much. It's been really great. And um, Greg's gonna give the final statements here. Okay, thank you so much, Julia, Cheryl, and Sydney. That was great. I did wanna give just a little bit of information. I talked about the professional and continuing education here at OSU. And the reason we like to partner with the Alumni Association and hear from our alumni is because we're often able to connect with the very widespread OSU network throughout not only the state of Oregon, but the U.S. and beyond. And each program we offer is designed for working professionals with convenient online classes and year-round start dates. We also offer customizable team training. Again, I would like to thank everyone that uh, attended. And this is great. And um, you guys delivered a ton of great content. And with that, I will wrap it up. So thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you. Go Beavers.